This is a college. Well, one part of it. So is this. And this. And this. And of course, this. Trevit, Trevit, Trevit. This is one of the students of the college. Trevit. And this is Caleb Mills, who in 1832 came out from Dartmouth by a riverboat and horseback to become the first professor of Wabash College. Where is Wabash? Well, that's a question we hope to answer. And that's why we made this film. Hello, I'm Ralph Edwards. And some of the scenes you've just looked at are from this picture. I'd like you to see all of it. Randy, roll it, will you please? Here at Wabash, I'm a member of the development board. Wabash is a kind of American educational institution, the kind of place with which our country's system of higher learning began, the small, privately endowed, independent, liberal arts college, which today stands guard over our educational system's classic tradition and academic freedom. Where is Wabash? Well, geographically, it's in the state of Indiana almost in the center of the town of Crawfordsville, which has a population of 15,000. It's a quiet, pretty town of wide streets, of comfortable homes with shady lawns. It's a town of small, lively industries. Yes, Crawfordsville, geographically, is the location of Wabash. On this 40-acre campus, a person has the sense of the blending of the past, of the present, and more importantly, of the future. It becomes easy to see the Presbyterian ministers and the laymen who met here in 1832 to organize a college in the wilderness. Easy to see them drop to their knees under these trees to dedicate their enterprise to God. That was 130 years ago. Much has happened since then. A freshman. His hat and its doffing marks him. What's he going to be like four years from now? Who knows? So much is up to him. As if I don't know. From the first day, they really throw it at you. This is Dr. Willis Johnson. He and two of his colleagues have written a biology textbook used in universities and colleges all over America. Schools ten times the size of Wabash use it for advanced students. Here, we get it right off the bat. Ever heard of brain stretching? Uh-huh. In lectures, we get the facts, the theories. After this, Wabash gives us the do-it-yourself routine. It pays off, though. You know, I wasn't even coming to Wabash. No liberal arts college for me. I wanted to start right out being a civil engineer. My father said he didn't think I was ready to specialize and that I should have a liberal arts education first. So I came to Wabash. After I got a B minus in calculus and studying all the time to do it, I guessed I wasn't cut out to be a civil engineer. I'm glad I found out. Here at Wabash, I discovered something else. What he had discovered was that Wabash, if students show any interest or talent, offers them a chance to learn by assisting the professors in any scientific investigation in which they may be involved. This could be experimenting with a diet of microscopic animals or working with radioactive materials. The whole point here is to see how fast a tree absorbs this radioactive material, how fast it reaches the leaves and in what quantity. We get credit for this extra work and during the summer get a chance to earn money as well. We studied the animals that may feed from the leaves that fall from the tree. We watch closely for any change in their normal life cycle. Quite a deal. So is working with Dr. Delaney. We've got quite a thing going here, as he says. What we are trying to do here is discover why one animal will reject some transplants and accept others. 
We're quite excited with our progress. Yeah, look. That hump is growing and it's alive. We transplanted it from some kind of an embryo. And now it's growing and maturing into some kind of a salamander, right on top of another. If a student becomes interested in this kind of work, especially pre-medical students, they may choose investigation as a career instead of clinical work. Get them interested on their own. That's the trick. And they must learn form, not just isolated facts. Facts are related. There are theories and conceptual schemes and models, all part of the form. This is Dr. Hainish, holder of an award from the American Chemistry Society for making significant contributions to the art of teaching chemistry. The fact, of course, is a fact, but it's not isolated. From facts, we build models and theories. Students have to understand this. Ingesting nothing but information is useless. Imparting this sense of the design of the world is my prime responsibility. I'm Ben Rogge, and as dean of the college, my primary concern is with the quality of the faculty, with the search for men who combine good scholarship with good teaching. The right kind of man, of course, is the man who is so excited about the materials of his own field so much in love with the ideas there that he's literally driven to teach and at the same time driven to continue his research and writing in the field. This is the kind of man we try to find. This is the kind of man we try to keep. This is Dr. Donald Baker, professor of English, a well-known contributor of poetry and prose to national periodicals. You know, one day Professor Baker was philosophizing about teaching how in chemistry, biology, and other sciences, actual results were visible. What a student learns is measurable. In English, he said, after a student has read, say, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, how do I know the result? Well, my answer to Professor Baker is that I intend on going into business, and in business, you have to know people. Look, you can learn in history, too. Take Professor Kurtz, for example. No matter what history he's teaching, he keeps harping on one thing. Human beings haven't changed much. Their environment, perhaps, but not the pressures not their nature. Sometimes great, talented, and unselfish men have made history. But conversely and sadly, corrupt and evil men have changed the course of the world too. If a student understands this, he soon knows that he must make up his mind. He must take a stand. If this happens, the job has been done. It's a matter of understanding values. So what does he do then? He sends us to the stacks of the Eli Lilly Library, and even though his book on the Federalist period is definitive, as they say, he makes us look up other authors that may disagree with him and are with each other. And you get marked on not whether you agree or disagree, but on how you form your opinion of what happened. You get to know. Il va installer les bagages. Installer les bagages. Installer les bagages. Ta yo ju. Ta yo ju. You get to know through languages, too. As Professor Planet says, learn a language and you learn a mind. Learn German and you learn a German's mind. To learn a foreigner's thoughts, his psychology, what better way to do this than to learn how they form such thoughts, the language? Look, let's not forget the big thing about Wabash. At least I think it is. What you learn in classes is one thing, but a school the size of Wabash offers one thing a big school can't. That's first-hand, face-to-face help from the faculty. Yeah, here you have a problem. You go straight to the professor, straight to the head of the department, and talk it over. And they talk. They don't make you feel that you're taking up their time, or that you're making them late for a faculty meeting, or that you're interrupting their writing. No, sir, they sit and talk. Even if you stop them on campus for a quick question, they give you time. And as for the bull sessions and the Scarlet Inn, Professors take part in them, too. And that's exactly and that's when the words start sing out. And that's exactly what Thornton Wilder is. But how much does intelligent he to hear words do with it? He's abstracted the person. But he's not well, completely abstracted. How much do you... Well, just how much, much you do the person out of his original element? Well, 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 a dancer's out of his real moves around out of the person himself. himself. He Kiss him again, he said. You've got a match, buddy. But that's precisely why some interpretive dancers are hard to interpret. I often wonder if Rosevere for all his blood that he didn't consider himself an ideal. The problem is that a person who considers himself a democrat is about an ideal society that... When I went to school, the world was a relatively stable place. 
Life, as my father knew it and as I knew it, despite the depression, was going to go on and on. How wrong I was. These young men don't have it so easy. It's a nervous time, but one of excitement and challenge. I don't envy today's college student, but there's one thing I'm sure of. He must be educated. And that isn't easy. But Wabash thinks it has the answer, and it's faculty. In men of real commitment to the liberal arts college in general, and to Wabash College in particular. However, it would be unrealistic to expect this commitment alone to always swing the decision in our favor. To keep the men we have and to attract the men we want, we must be in a position to compete in salaries, in teaching facilities, in research facilities, in the total living and working environment. That takes, among other things, money. What the dean is saying is that we're getting more than what we're paying for. Yeah, the faculty really has it. They have a feel for this place, no kidding. Many of them have had offers from bigger, more famous schools, and we have to see that they stay here and get more to come here. Other people recognize that Wabash isn't such a bad place. The Ford Foundation knows where Wabash is. Awarded us $2 million, provided Wabash raises $4 million. And Wabash was one of the original eight colleges in America. All liberal arts schools to receive this kind of a challenge grant. One building we will have soon is going up right here, where Old South Hall was. The social sciences, math, and history are going to be a lot better off than the new Baxter Hall. They're going to move the Institute for Personal Development to Baxter Hall. This is a program for young executives whose companies feel that if they spend part of their summer taking some liberal arts courses, they'll be better men and businessmen. Fred Handley, former executive vice president for the Eli Lilly Company, and now Vice President of Wabash, runs it. But it was started by Dr. Frank H. Sparks, former President of Wabash, who is now head of the Council for Financial Aid to Education. One building that is planned is one to house the Fine Arts Center. It includes a theater. When we get the center, it will replace Yandy's Hall. You guys know the gym was an armory back in World War I? Talk about needing something. Saw the plans for a new one. Pool and everything. A locker for everybody on campus. Man, the little giants really need it not just for varsity squads, but for intramurals and the whole phys ed program. Yeah, but let's not get sidetracked. Buildings we need, but a good faculty more. Because if you're going to cover all the fields, as you have to do to take liberal arts, chemistry, art, history, political science, the whole bit, When you're working, and working hard, for four years you want to get facts from the best. If you don't, well, you can be a good citizen, I guess, but you could have been better. And we all want to be better than better. A challenging statement from a challenging group of young men. If they were any more challenging, I don't know quite what would do. This is Norman Moore, Dean of Students. You see, the students, as well as the faculty, make Wabash a good place of learning. They're admitted with regard not only for their academic potential, but also for their promise as men. This is no hothouse environment. In fact, we encourage participation in the non-academic life of the college. Look, 